Waffles and Chain, and we're live. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to the season finale of Cosmos and Chain. We have Sam Bateman Fried. Uh, is that how you pronounce it? Fried or Freed? Uh, freed. Freed. Sorry, <laughs> I like all my good. All right. We have uh, we have Suzu from Three Arrows Capital and Eric Voorhees from Shape Shape Shift. Welcome everyone, and we have we have Sunny as well to be uh, co-moderator co-host. Um, so let's start with a quick round of intros, and then we'll get straight into you know C five versus D five. Does anyone want to start? Sure. Uh, I'm Sam Begman Fried. I'm the uh, CEO of FTX, a, a centralized crypto derivatives exchange. And I've also recently uh, helped start up uh, Project Serum, a, a decentralized uh, crypto ecosystem built on Solana. Very cool. I'm Stu. I uh, run a crypto hedge fund based in Singapore called Three Arrows Capital. Uh, we're one of the more active participants in both CFI and DeFi trading. Uh, market neutral as well as directional as well as uh, passive investments in the space so um i'm eric okay. yeah i'm eric Voorhees. i am the founder and ceo of shapeshift so shapeshift is a uh, digital asset exchange uh, that's also a self-custody platform for managing your crypto assets so i Love crypto, and I've been getting uh, increasingly excited about the Cosmos world. So really happy to be on the show with you guys. Thank you for being here. And I hey guys, my name is Sunny, and I'm co-moderating this, but also just really into DEXs. I've been spent a lot of time thinking about them. Um, I was previously one of the develop core developers on Cosmos, and now I'm uh, sort of working on some new projects uh, in the Cosmos ecosystem, but d building some fun tools that could help DEXs. Yeah, and we'll get into some of what you're building today uh, on Decentralized Exchange, Sunny. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, a little bit about me. I'm just the resident cosmonaut here in the Cosmos Space Station. That's why you see me wearing a helmet. So today, uh, let's talk about DeFi. Right now, this first segment of this call, we're going to be uh, covering mostly AMMs. Uh, and then during the second segment, we'll, you know, Eric, we'll have a one-on-one a -on -one with Eric Voorhees to talk about C5, and then we'll open up the floor to Q&A from uh, everybody on the YouTube live stream right now. So yeah, let's get right into it. So everybody has been following AMMs very closely right now. It kind of just uh, exploded into the scene right now. And I just want to have a high-level idea about what everyone's thoughts are about, you know, whether automatic market makers are here to stay or if they are just kind of, you know, the f flavor of the week. So I feel like, I mean, a few months ago, I felt honestly like they sort of had no hope. I now think they have hope, but I still think that they're in their current form, not going to be very large for very long. Um, but I think that some su like substantially more sophisticated versions could be. Um, the really cool thing about AMMs is that they're easy. And, and and just to give like a sense of that, and I think that this is like a lot of people realize this, but some don't. Here's the really fucking awesome thing about an AMM. You start a crypto project and you have a token. It's like an early stage project. You don't have a market maker. You don't even know how to find a good market maker. You don't know how to do liquidity or where or what like that whole thing is just a morass for a lot of projects and so instead what you do is you're just like all right here's the deal i have some tokens and i got a thousand ether so i'm gonna put a thousand ether and 20 million of my tokens in this pool and never think about it again and now there's enough liquidity to get this token off the ground and eventually like the ecosystem will figure out the liquidity thing or maybe i will when we're bigger but, but this is step one, and then I can just go back to building. And that's just super awesome. Um, and it's it's way better than the other options you have if you're a really early stage project. Um, so that's that's the big advantage of it. The problem is that uh, it's like AMMs are not good 
in other ways. Like it, you just like are constantly getting picked off if you're providing them like 24 seven. And the fees are extremely high to account for that, which means that it's really inefficient to do trading that's not like picking someone off to market moves through it. And so they're just not good at scaling. Um, and But what I think we're going to see is AMMs that have that first property of really easy to use while not having the second property. And so what, what you can imagine is, first of all, lower latency and lower gas fees. Uh, so there's like less arbitrage there. Um, and then second of all, sort of customizable curves. So you can like think about what the actual liquidity curve you want to provide is. And you can even programmatically feed, you know, liquidity curves in real time to it, you know, as you sort of like change your mind about what you want to be doing or something like that. But also you can just put funds in and never think about it to provide liquidity. And that that has a better shot at combining like ease of use with like substantially less inefficiency. Yeah, I kind of completely agree here where like, I think MMs make a lot of sense for like tail end assets, but like when you're talking about like larger liquidity, like volume stuff, I think I, I call AMMs DMMs because they're just dumb market makers. And um, yep. I think we have the potential to make them smarter, uh, you know, uh, but like SPF said, like, you know, just add, the very simplest thing is at least take into account volatility, right? Like your curve yeah. should at least be somehow adaptive to like historical volatility and like current AMMs are just completely not. And so that's sort of a, a, a problem. Uh, but then at the same time, then it turns into this problem though. It's like, you know, market makers have come up, you know, SPS probably knows better than anyone. Like they've come up with very sophisticated algorithm algorithms for market making, and they don't want to just give these away by making right. them public on chain. And so I wonder if like, you're ever going to have AMMs actually going to have as sophisticated algorithms as like private market makers. Yeah. I doubt you're ever going to have like, you know, top HFT firm providing via an AMM. Um, but uh, one thing you can do, which I think is super cool, is you can use composability to combine an AMM with an order book. And that, that's like one thing Serum's planning to do is you've got, we've got order books on chain and we're building on chain AMMs. And then you can have the AMMs provide on the order books, provide liquidity on the order books in the same place as other market makers are. So at least you're not sort of sharding liquidity or volume that way. Is this something that could be combined between, you know, a centralized exchange like Shapeshift or Binance with with an, AM, an AMM to provide like a C DeFi solution? I I think it's worth pointing out that um, pre, well, it, back when centralized exchanges were really the only game in town, which has been most of crypto's history, they were all to my knowledge order book exchanges and somehow um, people started trying to build order book exchanges on in decentralized ways and so you had a first a first generation of these decentralized exchanges that were order books uh, and they were cool and they kind of worked but they didn't take off and then people started building these AMMs in a decentralized way and those totally took off uh, and so I, we, we haven't seen like centralized AMMs or or successful decentralized order books yet, which I find interesting. And maybe Sam, you can highlight why you yeah. think that's been the case. Well, Eric, in well, a way, wouldn't you say that Shapeshift was like the closest thing to a centralized AMM? Like it was that, it wasn't, Shapeshift not, wasn't an order book. No, I mean, Shapeshift is not an AMM like. It's not an like AMM, Uniswap. but it's like a, yeah. more like an RFQ style system. Yeah, like it, it looks like an AMM to the takers, but not to the makers. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Our, so, the, yeah go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say one answer of that I, I can mostly answer, which is that Ethereum just cannot support order books on chain. Um, it just doesn't have the throughput for it. And you can just like convince yourself of that very quickly. Ethereum has like the order of 10 transactions per second. And um, a single order takes multiple transactions and each transaction costs like a dollar. And so imagine someone trying to provide liquidity. You, you look at centralized exchanges, orders are flashing constantly. And you have market makers canceling and replacing bids and offers like 10 times a second, that would eat the entire, like a single order book would eat more than the entire throughput of the Ethereum network and be paying billions a year in, in gas. So it's just, you can't do it on Ethereum. Um, you can do it on faster chains. And, but that that's like a necessary step of, of getting on chain order books to work. My theory for either centralized AMMs is generally worse in most ways, not in all ways, 
but like order books are generally better. And so that's what centralized exchanges do because they can, because they can rent out data centers. But um, uh, but they're not better in all ways as like AMMs have shown, you know, over the last uh, few months. I think one way too that we, we can kind of see that AMMs are, are not that organic right now yet is that when they did the Uniswap retrospective uh, drop, right, of uni on people, uh, the, 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 the biggest beneficiaries were people in the uh, ether versus synthetic ether pool and ample versus ether pool, which themselves are re-incentivized by things outside of Uniswap, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So in a way, it kind of shows that, well, you know, clearly it's not that profitable to provide into these pools without some outside incentive that is making them stay in there, right? whether it's the project themselves uh, or, or something else. And I think that with that said though, it is interesting to see if the Uniswap model can persist as it is, because right now, even with the, the toxic flow uh, from, from latency arbitrage, uh, there is enough natural flow or benign flow that I think right now it is still profitable to provide in Uniswap pools and then hedge out the risk. And I think that was true for Sushi as well in the beginning, uh, which is why you guys were very big in it. So I think despite it being, um, despite it being sort of uh, naive to be a national and a provider, given the overlay of governance tokens, it, it is not as naive. But then the question is, can those tokens ultimately retain value, right? Can these governance tokens eventually earn a piece of the pie? Uh, yeah. So I guess the most bullish case for these would be, may not be my view necessarily at this moment, but it is uh, the most bullish case for these would be that these governance tokens accrue value from their ability to govern these AMMs, to change these parameters, to decide where the rewards go, and then you know you can have a a mecca of AMMs where you know the, the users are governing what happens. Uh, but but that vision is obviously challenged by the fact that it is relatively easy to fork these as well, and the distributions you know who is to say the uni distribution is so holy that you cannot fork it again. Who is to say that, that that any AMM distribution is holy, that 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 you can't fork it? Because these are not Bitcoin, right? These are not things where it's trying to be a money. It's it's, it's technology. So then, you know, who do we say? Uh, how do we say that this is what is finalized, and that these governance tokens uh, can't can't be forked? So really, yeah. aren't we just yeah. going to have like one or two more iterations of this, and everyone's going to be like, wait, let's just go back to the, ori the original Uniswap without built-in governance seemed to have been working fine. Let's just go. You may back. not need a token. You may not need yeah, a token. You don't need for a token at all, right? Like eventually LP providers are going to get annoyed and be like, wait, why are we giving shares to right. like, these like uni token or the sushi token holders? Let's just like keep all of it for ourselves. Uh, well, I think what I'd say is like, what you're presupposing there is that none of these other protocols get better. And I think that's maybe the key thing here is like, you know, going back to like, why can, why does an exchange get to charge fees, right? Like sort of what you're saying is like, why pay fees, right? Like Sushi Swap now has five bit fees on it, net fees. Uniswap doesn't have fees. So there's nothing for the token, but that's going to change. You know, the tokens are going to vote to implement fees, probably five bips. Um, and then all of a sudden it's going to open up the same question of why are we paying fees on this? Obviously you're going to be happy if you're a Uni token holder or a Sushi token holder, but not necessarily if you're a trader on it. And I think what I'd say is like, why do centralized exchanges get to charge fees? Forkability is one thing, but you can't fork the future, right? Even if someone else got a copy of the FTX code base tomorrow, like good fucking luck running that shit. Like, yeah. it, you know, it would fall apart and it would not progress. And FTX would be a massively better product in a year. And so I think the thing that I would say is like, yes, if all of the projects are ever going to do is, is, is fork the current basic AMM, then uh, none of these tokens are going to have long-term value. It's just all going to go to whichever doesn't charge fees, which anyone can create, or like a race to the bottom in fees. But if some of these have actual real people and teams building them and constantly making them cooler and better, uh, then that could justify people paying an extra five bips to use them. Now, there's a race because each step can be forked, but but at least now you have like it, it's, it's like gets way harder to fork if it keeps mm -hmm. getting better and starts getting integrated into the other things in the ecosystem. But I would have ha been happy to have like my five bips go directly to the Uniswap development team rather than this like uni token, or uh, you know have all of it go right. into like a development pool directly. Uh, you may have been would you see happy like not as happy presumably as it going to the token or like basically irrelevant or are you saying like happier? I would have been happier. I 
if a fork came along and said all like five bits yep. are put into a into a, a development pool, that would be better than to me than like putting it towards like just bet, paying off like a bunch of early LP providers. Yeah, although that's mostly what uni is long term. Like long term, realistically speaking, most of this is not held by the early LP providers. Um, some of it is obviously, but like the majority, uh, the majority is not. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, you know, you're going to end up with something kind of similar, although you get wacky short term effects with the restricted circulating supply. One thing, like, you know, we mentioned that like, oh, a lot of us think that like, oh, this is useful for a tail end. Like, what do you think about the decision for you need to like, like going forward, at least like for now, it starts off with like future uni are distributed to like the ETH, USDC pool, USDT pool, DAI pool, and then WPTC pool. It's like, this is the opposite of the, the tail end pools. This is like the highest volume, highest like liquidity pools or not liquidity, but highest like not tail end. Right. I think it's a noble yeah. effort. Yeah, it's a, it's a noble yeah. effort, but I but I think it's going to end in tears uh, for for quite some number of reasons. I think you've, I mean, by having incentivized these pools, a lot of dumber money has come into them as well and said, okay, I'm just going to pro provide in these, and they don't really even know how to calculate their profit and loss. They don't know how to hedge uh, with options. <clears throat> um, so, you know, we've spoken to a number of market participants that you know they've raised products in some countries like China money into these uh, on behalf of clients. And when you think about that, you think, well, if you have a, if you have a big move down in Ether, let's say it goes down to 30% in, in a day, uh, these people are going to wake up with huge losses relative to what they put in. And there's no hedging going on. So I, I think in, in some ways it was almost irresponsible even because, uh, because it creates such a liquidity flashpoint, right? It's like usually it's very hard to sell or buy a lot of Ether, uh, but now you made it really easy. By doing this, and I think it's, that's why it's no surprise to the, the market in Ether has really tanked since it started. At first, it went up, right, because people were saying, "Okay, well, you have to buy Ether to contribute yep. to these pools." Yeah. And then people were like, "Wait, but but why would I do that?" Like now, this is the perfect showing point for a dump, right? And and so I kind of think um, it's a noble effort, but it's the the biggest issue with these incentives that I have with these is is that. It is just very inorganic. It's just people saying, this is what I want to do. Here are the numbers. Let, let's see what happens. The token is this price. Like, there's just no real calibration, right? It's like what Sonny said. There's no volatility calculations. There's no, like, market conditions. You know, look, like, imagine you, you incentivize everyone to put into a pool right before non-farm payrolls, right, in the U.S. Uh, macro markets. You incentivize everyone to go into, like, a Euro USD pool right before huge news. Like you're just putting the you know you're you're setting up sheep up to slaughter basically. So so I think it's it's been a relatively like like it, it's still relatively quiet now even because you know it's only gone from three eighty to three twenty. But you could see like going to one eighty or something. You could see that in like a day. And then I don't know what the mentality will be for, for people to go into AMMs if they've gone into these very liquid pools very big. Whereas if it was at least long tail pools, then people can say okay, well. I'm relatively indifferent between this token and ether. Like it's it's all it's all sort of part of my alt basket or it's all part of my DeFi basket. Right. But here you're having people put up real risk, right? Like hundreds of millions have flown in these pools, over a billion dollars in all four of these together. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, don't worry, it, it it it's it's only impermanent loss. Just tell your investors that they'll they'll be chill. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I completely hundred percent agree with that. Um, the only thing I would add is. Uh, thinking about this from like Uniswap's point of view, like why would they do this as opposed to long tail? I think it might be the high upside play. I'm not saying it's going to work, but like mm -hmm. if you want to say like what's the world where Uniswap becomes fucking massive, I think it probably is a world where it's able to compete on the large names. Like I, I think, I, I think that if if you're looking upside, you probably want to do that, and and, and then also have some plan for why it's not going to end the way you said. Which, to be clear, would be like my default guess as well. But, but you know, you you think that Uniswap, like, put yourself in in, in the mind of someone who is Uniswap and thinks V three is gonna be fucking amazing as shit, right? And it's gonna solve all these problems, gonna be better than than centralized exchanges and all that. Then I think it sort of like makes sense to compete on compete on the majors. I think that that has to be sort of like the and and you're sort of upside looking at upside, not just like getting something. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's I. 
yeah, it's 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 also it's not the natural thing. So you, you guys are talking about a lot of um, a lot of things that maybe you know the dumb retail flow doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing that they should understand, and they don't seem to care even about this, is the crazy gas costs of using it. Yeah. Um, and whenever I've gone into Uniswap to play around, <laughs> I, you know, I want to do like a hundred dollar trade and just see how it's working. And there's like a thirty five dollar fee. Um, yeah. <laughs> And yet it's it's working in that climate. So like it is so powerful and is bringing in so many people that despite those ridiculous fees, they're still finding it useful. What, how do you explain that? Uh, billions upon billions of dollars of definitely utility tokens dropped for free to pay mm -hmm. for all those costs. I, I completely agree. And to be clear, two months ago, up until two months ago, all of DeFi in history put together every project from every day forever all that volume summed up was less than the volume on ftx on its biggest day hmm. so up until a few months ago the volumes in DeFi were were tiny compared to centralized exchanges for exactly the reason you said and if you realize ftx's biggest day is not crypto's biggest like like other exchanges had bigger biggest days um but What's happened in the last few months is like you add up the market cap of all of the tokens that were airdropped on people for providing liquidity in these things, and you get like I th I think like five billion dollars or something. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a lot. Like you can pay, you can subsidize a lot of people's impermanent loss and a lot of people's gas costs for five billion dollars. Now you can't keep doing that. Eventually, you're out of tokens to give, and now you've given away all your tokens, and now everything leaves. Like that's the worry. And the probably second, the exactly. default. The, the tokens that were dropped, and then the second, which was the uh, like the Ponzi games, so like SPF. Oh like, yeah, okay. The tokens that are dropped is sort of the hopeful phrasing of it, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but there's also like the ample stuff, right? Where it's like the AMM doesn't automatically change price based off like changes to supply, right. and so yeah. that made like for a fun game for people to play. So that that certainly explains the coins and the pools that are having airdrops in them, but it was not all, all the pools have that, right? A lot of them did. So, like, you look at like what Sushi Swap, Uniswap, Air dropped on all of these other things put together. It was a lot of the pools. It wasn't the long tail pools, except for the tokens involved in this. But, like the major pools got covered by this. I mean, there's also an extent to be said where like, part of it might be for like the other reason people might be using DEXs as well is for like uh, anonymity purposes and things like that. And so right. I wonder how how much of an extent that plays into it as well. Like yeah, I mean, I don't want to go through KYC and whatnot. It's it's definitely something, but like I mean, you can just compare it to like uh, six months ago, right? And that gives you a baseline for how much that contributes, and it's like ten million dollars a day of volume globally. Um, yeah. To be clear, that's not the entire anonymous volume. That's a Dex volume from anonymity. Uh, some of the anonymous volume goes on, you know, Bitmax or Bybit or. Mm -hmm. And then, and I think it's also very tied to the uh, the concept of yield farming, right? Which has gotten quite large. Uh, start, you know, starting with compound, with comp, and then going very quickly toward a whole number of ways people farm. Uh, I think that kind of becomes a big overlay where people say, okay, even if my gas is thirty five dollars, it's still worth it for me to farm and dump this or farm and buy this. Uh, so, so it becomes just one number in. In the uh, variable, in, in the whole calculation of prop, profit and loss, right? And I think also that um, with this increased liquidity in AMMs, which is not something that everyone considers, but you have fundamentally the way that these arbitrage transactions get get settled or or decided who gets that transaction is fundamentally through gas price auctions, right? Where people are trying to bid each other up for gas. So the, the uh, seen gas fee or the medium gas fees can be very high. That doesn't necessarily mean that retail users are fine paying those. It could mean that that is the price, that that is, a dollar, that is where the dollar auction cleared for the arbitrage firms to take that liquidity now that the centralized markets have moved, right? So like the total dystopian scenario for Ethereum is that, you know, like everyone's put, like, you know, all the Muppets put their capital in these AMMs. Um, no one can use it now because gas is, let's say, a thousand or five hundred or something. And the only people who can use it are these firms that are 
bidding for the you know, for the right to arb that pool against the real market. Uh, and and that that I think kind of played out a, a few days ago. Guess come off of it now. It's still obviously very high for almost all retail use cases uh, of DeFi. But the really interesting question will be like when the when the yield farming returns get very low, you know, as low as centralized exchanges, will people still stay in these pools? Will they find it interesting? Um, the answer is yes. And there's enough value capture from these governance tokens, then you could have that be a U-shaped recovery or a V-shaped recovery. And people say, okay, we actually governing a lot here. Our volume is higher than Coinbase. Our volume is higher than, you know, centralized exchanges. Uh, but that's the key question. Can they make it so that enough normal flow can happen, right? Uh, when tokens were pumping a lot, there was still a lot of normal flow that was happening because people were, you know, aping into one coin and then quickly selling into another. Uh, but if tokens don't go up anymore, I don't know if people do that either, right? Like, do 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 people trade on you know some every day when all their coins are down eighty percent or seventy percent? Uh, I don't know why they would, but they who knows? Mm-hmm. So so. I think the market's about to go through that test uh, and it has to figure out what has been made that is a mirage and what has been made that is that that will last. So, mm-hmm. so what's the real moat here? Is it liquidity or is it what the player one that has the most liquidity on chain? It's liquidity is one of them. Uh, future building is one of them. If you think a project is going to release cool things in the future, that can't be forked yet um things that require like community and have like network benefits i uh, you know coordination problems are hard to solve so you get sort of kind of mediocre moats from that i uh, and then just sort of like you know i uh, that's the right word for it like everyone agreeing that something is the best and nothing can challenge it creates a moat around it even if it's not true Okay. I mean, yeah. It just would it also just be like access to retail flow, like so, you know, whether it's through like if you own the aggregator, is that going to be sort yeah. of the biggest thing? It's something, although maybe, it, yeah, it's at least some some sort of gatekeeper. Yeah. What happens, you know, when these utility tokens become classified as securities when regulation comes down? Are you talking about the United States or not the United States? <laughs> Well, let's say United States and, you know, European Union. So the majority of volume in crypto is not the United States, not the vast, like there's a lot in the United States, but like a lot of exchanges have had good businesses on the model of just don't do the United States and do everything else. So that I, I don't know if that's the answer, but like, I wouldn't be shocked if that's the answer. It's just like, oh, fuck it. Like, there goes the US can't do DeFi anymore. I like this is going to be a tough thing for people to contend with. And I don't know how everyone is going to, to choose to do it. Um, the other thing is, I don't think it's like a given that these will be like, there's, there's a lot of ambiguity over different tokens, different tokens have served different features, but mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. The, it's certainly not clear which tokens will be categorized as securities. Most of them are in some degree of gray area, but in the context of these DEXs, it doesn't really matter because there's no gatekeeper deciding what is placed on them and anyone can access them and, and buy them. So let's say half the tokens on Uniswap were declared a security tomorrow. Um, I'm sure that would change people's valuation of the tokens to some degree, but it doesn't change the ability to, to trade them. And that's the main difference between these and the centralized exchanges. I think there's an interesting question of whether like Uniswap dot exchange would IP block or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, but that just that just causes the fork to happen, right? Like if you right, you get into an interesting game of cat and mouse there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think also it's um it's interesting because some projects have very high percentage of previous investor ownership and some of them don't, right? So the ones like Uniswap that does have a very high percentage to the investors and to the team. And those are public people, whereas some other DeFi projects, they have a very low or zero percentage. I think that that for regulators, it'll look easier to go after ones with teams that they, people they can subpoena or people they can ask questions to very readily. But 
Um, there's probably also a kind of game theory for regulators too, where they're like, well, they know that these all these more impossible to regulate uh, DEXs do exist. So if you just regulate the ones you can speak with, then you're kind of pushing volume even further toward <laughs> stuff you can't touch. So there's some chance that they view that kind of as a, as a landscape and then they just say, we have better things to be doing, right? Um, I think there's some chance you see that in the device space uh, to a larger extent to a larger extent than the naysayers uh, currently say. Because I mean, the naysayers are correct too, right? These are clearly securities from the point of view of the fact that you have the team, then you have the coin, then you have the revenues, uh, the promise of future revenues, you know, the incentivization of the team. I mean, even in the language, they're not even trying anymore, right? To, to, to look at the Howie test. So I think yeah. they must know a lot more than we all do, right? When, when it comes to the regulators, because they're, you know, these are listing immediately on Coinbase. Uh, so, um, all I can say is, if if it were the case that regulators take a dumber stance toward DeFi token governance tokens, it may be because of that reason, because they see it as an inevitability uh, of the market. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. One thing, great. yeah, I, I think like it's super interesting. I wonder if you're right. You might be. I, I I'm like super unsure. Like you could imagine that they just know something we don't. You can also imagine that we just know something they don't, and I don't. I don't sort of don't know which it is. You know, I, I mean, it's on the one hand, it and Coinbase is a weird thing, right? Like it's just projects doing this. Yeah, they're, they're just, maybe just fucking up. It's, I mean, you don't expect Coinbase to do that, right? Like you expect that's yeah. not their mo, right? It's like they're super fucking conservative. Like I think they still have listed, an IPO. right? And they still haven't fucking listed Tron. I think is that right? I think they haven't listed Tron, and, and like. It's. I mean, say what you will about Tron, but like, it's hard to argue. Like, like that. That's like you know. But but on the other hand, they're listing all these new things. It, it's it's weird. I don't know what to think about it exactly. Um, one thing I will say is like my sense is that most projects in DeFi, not all, but most, when you ask like why they make the decisions they do in terms of structure and regulatory decisions. Like they're just wrong. They're just making bad decisions, and it's not that they. It's not that you just get like a binary question or like let's check bad. Um, it's that it's really hard to do things right. Like it, it just takes work, and like you know, it, it's not just a matter of checking the right box. Um, and like you know, it's I. Uh, it's it, yeah. It's not something you accidentally get right. You know, and, and so I think that's like another thing. But the truth is that n no one in the industry or in the regulators or even in the legal profession know which of these tokens will be classified as what. It's really tricky. Some are obvious on both sides, but most are in sort of a weird gray middle. And there's a lot of variables and a lot of tea leaf reading. Um, and the reason that the SEC doesn't want to move faster on some of these projects is because they're not sure which one they'll end up losing. And once they lose a case, it starts challenging lots of other cases. So if you yeah. notice, all the cases that they've gone after have been um, yes. the low the low hanging fruit. Oh, the egregious ones. Yeah, egregious yeah. ones, because uh, they feel comfortable that those are slam dunks. Well, plus a few weird ones, like tr like Telegram, right? Like that one kind of came out of nowhere. But, but by and large, yeah. Yeah, but I think they. I think even in the Telegram case, they felt like that was that was an easy one based on how that one was structured. Easy, I don't know. It's structured the same way a lot of other things. Not exactly the same, but like my sense. I I'm not an expert here, but my sense from talking to people is that was surprising. That like that that sort of like generally they like what you're saying is just right, but that like even a lot of legal professionals were like a little bit surprised that like that one ended the way it did. That it was like like you know didn't. A lot of people wouldn't have thought that was in the egregious case um, and, and thought maybe there is something going on in the background where they just, you know, one of them just like accidentally punched the SEC regulator and like, <laughs> uh, there's just, yeah, I, I don't know, I mean, I don't know, but say. like, yeah. Like, there's also a wide range of middle ground too, right? Like if the regulators go toward the team and they say, you guys, you yeah. guys have done a securities offering, there's a wide range of things that could then happen, you know, there could be a fine. Exactly. There could be a return of an investor fund if there was a pre-sale, but many of these don't have pre-sales to their credit. So that helps yeah. them a lot. There's nothing to return. Uh, and then and then and then so I think the difference between EOS and then Telegram may have been the approach of their legal counsels. Uh, yeah. 
that, I, yeah, I completely agree. Like one story here is that Telegram's like, fuck you, you're wrong. This is ridiculous. And the SEC was like, all right, engage with us. It's like, no, fuck you. You can't, like Watch you're getting language. in the way of business. And Telegram was like, no, fuck you. And the SEC was like, all right then. Like, yeah. sure. Uh, and whereas with EOS, they're like, all right, like, yes, we understand that that we did something in optimistically the gray area. We're sorry. Uh, we want to make this right. Something like that. I don't know. I make it, but like, you know, that, 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 more, more that, deferential. that might be the, I think yeah, also, so. I think also with Telegram and then with, uh, I guess, Kin as well, the, in both cases, there was the smoking gun, right? as Eric points out, which is that they had a previous company that was doing something. And there was this idea that some of these, some of this money could even be used for that previous company. And so it's kind of that mixture, which, which I think mm. you know, makes it so that the SEC is like, okay, well, this is just absurdly e easy now because you're raising this token for this and then it's right. going to be used for that. Um, whereas in DeFi, you don't really have that as much. Like there's not as much to go after, right? Like they haven't, there may not even be a large, treasury to go after. There may not even be a large anything to go after. So, so was in the, I actually don't know, in the Ken and Telegram cases, was the theory that the, that the companies would basically be subsumed by the token and everything from them would flow into the token? Or was it not that, and instead this was like a raise for the company with a token that would have some interaction with it, but not represent really ownership of the company in any meaningful or economic sense? I think the latter, more the latter. Yeah. But not that there was zero economic sense, but there was zero right. legal they, sense they, or claim. They, they were not equity. There's not equity, but it also wasn't like a compound like thing. Like, like you could say like, you know, with many of these governance tokens that like it's, it's a raise for the, the protocol, but there's sort of this, this, this like retort of like, no, the protocol is just the token. It's a raise for itself. It, it's not even a raise. Like it's, you know, that all the money flows back, not to, to, to the token or something like, you know, uh, and, and maybe you couldn't make that, maybe there's still a centralized company with revenue that the owners were keeping in addition to this token, but related to it even after the token or something. And I'm, I'm bullshitting here, but. Well, I wonder why they didn't go after OMG then <laughs> in that case, because there was an existing company uh, before. Did they not raise in the US or something? I, I don't know their history. Yeah. There's yeah. A, lo a lot of variables, right? A, a company that receives money and sells a token is not in and of itself enough. Yeah. There has to be a number of different triggers that are met. And again, the SEC seems to want to go after what are perceived as bad actors, rightly or wrongly. Mm -hmm. uh, and what everyone is trying to guess <laughs> is how far down the curve they will try to go, mm -hmm. right? Will they try to go after everyone that's ever made a token? Or will they just go after people that are scamming others? It'll be somewhere between those extremes. No one, no one's sure. So, All right. Eric, what's uh, the plan? What are Shapeshift's plans with DeFi? Like, are, is, are you, you know, you guys seem like you'd be in a good position to build an aggregator or like, even like, you know, I, I one thing I've been waiting for is someone to build like a good RFQ system on chain where my, 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 my web, the web app will just ping a bunch of market makers and like give me quotes and then I can submit those quotes and they execute on chain and give me the same UX as if I was using Uniswap. Like, and I thought Shapeshift would have been like, wow, that's a perfect thing for Shapeshift to build. So like, yeah, what I, are you guys doing? I, I won't reveal too much, but I'll, I'll say that we are, we are increasingly interested in embracing the amazing yeah. innovations that are going on in, decentralization of these exchanges. The, oh. the speed with which they're moving, the, the increase in UX, um, the fact that they are, these decentralized exchanges do for the purpose of exchange what Bitcoin did for money itself, which is to break it out of a bordered jurisdictional based concept. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're just inspiring. I think it's just, uh, it's just amazing. So um, so yeah, Shapeshift is thinking about this very closely and, and starting to take some actions, but I don't want to hmm. reveal too much right now. So I mean, there's going to be some, you know, DJ and farmers on Shapeshift soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also just really hard to like see the signal through the noise sometime because in the, these DeFi DGens, like every 
every three days their attention is on something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of that is valid new innovation and a lot of that is garbage. Um, but it's all moving around so quickly that like, even to try to keep up with it is a, a full-time job. And it's, I don't know about you guys, but I find it overwhelming. Oh yeah. It, you know, shameless plug. Serum has an fully on-chain order book and matching engine index, tons of liquidity, it's a tiny fraction of a penny for orders. And uh, we'd be happy to have Shapeshift plug into it. It's all, it's all open source, all on-chain. We, we will look into it. All right, thank you. Uh, liquidity providers is sort of the, the boring answer. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, you could you could maybe take a guess, but uh, uh, yeah, there, there's uh, uh, liquidity providers backing the project. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you can get a lot of liquidity if you have motivated actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's talk what? about Serum. Oh, how, how sure. Let's talk about one quick, really quick about AMMs, which was like, um, what do you guys think about like, uh like uh synthetic am like like perpetual amms for example like uh they use like the virtual amm term which i think is a dumb term it's called a bonding curve but uh right. now, what, you think like these have like use cases going forward or also not really it's sort of similar to the other thing you could do it you come up with a smarter version she's better i sort of think you're going to want an order book eventually somewhere in there I, I sort of think it's gonna be hard without that to really scale it. I think you're gonna get some action on them, but I sort of think that the future is of non heavily incentivized large volume is is gonna be on order books in DeFi. But I mean, you know, I've been proven wrong multiple times in the last few months. Maybe it'll happen again. I think with these, um, I'm, I'm actually more bullish on it for synthetic AMMs or for virtual AMMs, just, just because there's more real world analogies for how that already works in the real world. So in the retail FX space, almost all benign flow, it doesn't hit the market, right? It's internalized by the by the broker. And because the broker knows that on average, the client will lose money and also that the flow is counterbalancing, right? There's for every buyer, there's a seller, you know, so, and then you may be surprised to find that even in the institutional FX markets, 75% of institutional flow is also internalized by large dealer banks, right? So if you're a if you're a company, you try to convert your euros to US dollar, even an $80 million trade, the bank is not hedging that immediately. He's internalizing that, and then he's waiting for the other side of that trade to come by and then net it, right? Or he's waiting something else. So I think the idea of flow internalization is actually very... It's very old. It's a, it's a very old idea. And I think one of the powerful things that DeFi has done, which I do think is lasting, is that now you can do peer to contract trading or peer, peer to pool trading as opposed to all just peer to peer, which is what essential limit order book is. So I, so I think the reason why I think I'm a little more bullish on that is because you, the, the, the contributors to the capital that is backing this, they can contribute in a single currency, like let's say in USD or in ETH or in BDC. And they can say, okay, based on how good my AMM is at, at incentivizing and internalizing flow, I will now make money on my money. Whereas in normal AMM, where you just have two assets, you know, unless there was an overlay of a hedging protocol that people that can then have access to, people just have no clue what, what, you know, what they have. They wake up in the morning and they're like, so how much Bitcoin do I have? How, you know, how much Ether do I have? How much USD do I have? So I think um, there's definitely... Uh, maybe both central limit and uh, AMMs in the derivative space because if you can segment flow well enough, if you can do, let's say, a last look or like a fee reclamation, then you can wipe out all the guys that are coming in with latency ARP and you can try to keep as much, and then you can make fees very low. You can make zero fees uh, for your very benign flow, which makers may actually want to internalize. You can have negative fees, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, I think there's going to be a lot of trade-offs on that on that plane, and it's not clear that it's a winner-take-all market structure at all. Because if you look at traditional markets, it is definitely not a winner-take-all market structure, right? You have central limit books, you, you, you have dark pools, you have internalizers, you have everything. So I think it's, it's going to be very fragmented for sure. I have a quick question for, uh, for you guys. Are there AMMs or anything like it in traditional finance, or is that a purely crypto innovation? It's, it's just crypto. Yeah. Just crypto. And what? Why? Because they suck. 
Uh, no, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the reason AMMs came about is because you like on chain Ethereum does not have the processing power for an order book. Like that's where they came from. And that's like not a problem if you're not in DeFi and not in crypto. Uh, so you can just have now to, to be clear, not everything's an order book. There's a lot of RFQ style trading and like, and Susu is talking about a lot of that as well. Like, you know, it's uh, a lot of finance looks more like shapeshift than it does like, you know, finance or FTX. Um, uh, but, uh, and so that, that, that's another very, very common. I mean, that's what Robinhood is, right? Um, but I don't another uh, piece. I don't right. think it's just the scalability. I think it's also the trustless liquidity providing because yes. you know Shapeshift could go ahead and provide an RFQ system on chain, but I can't trustlessly give my 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 money to Shapeshift to like market make using my. You can money. build. Uh, yeah, you with enough processing power, you can. Like on Solana, you can do that. And no, same way, I, we how can I? How can I like? So let's say I'm 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 trusting shapeshift to like do why do you need to trust someone what you could just build an on-chain rfq um how, how do you update prices then uh based on the whatever liquidity source on chain you're looking at whether it's a dex or an or an order book either way it like the prices it shows just reflects the prices in that on-chain liquidity source um yeah but like an rfq is yeah. like well, that's like almost like a AMM then, right? Where it's like it's taking some on-chain data, so it's not now it's not just like the value of these two things, but it's like you know, okay, give me the spot price from the order book that's on the chain. But I'm saying, like, well, what do you mean the value of these things? Like, I suspect Shapeshift is doing the same thing in the back end, roughly. I mean, it's doing something slightly different, right? It's like pinging some market maker instead of pinging some AMM or order book, um, and it's doing that because that's where the liquidity is, and that's a lot easier. And also, you can't do this on Ethereum anyway, but I. Uh, theoretically, if you had all the liquidity on chain and the chain was fast and cheap, um, there's like, I, yeah. I'm tweaking a little bit under the rug, right? Like, I'm ignoring the fact that you won't really be able to lock in price. Like, you don't have the thing where like, it says, this is the price. You have 30 seconds to click OK. Like, if you wait to click OK for 10 seconds, the price might move. So it's it's like not not quite the same user experience. But like, Theoretically, this could all happen trustlessly on chain. I'm not, it's asking, just I'm that, not talking about the trading. I'm talking about the liquidity. Like, so I, how, who, do, so yep. if I give my money to, uh, so let's say Shapeshift is running an RFQ on Solana. Yep. I give my money to uh, Shapeshift. Uh, how do uh, I know they don't just like? You don't have to put into of, their personal account. Can be a smart contract that, and and that smart contract can be such that you can always withdraw from it. They can't, and the only thing it's ever allowed to do is trade against the liquidity source. Like as an example, go to dex.projectserum.com and then like imagine that instead of having like a, a, a like limit order entry form, it just had like a box which showed you the price of a market order in each direction, right? Like an AMM does. Um, that's like kind of replicating that, right? And you could have an aggregator in the middle, right? Like Shapeshift, I'm guessing is, is sort of aggregating multiple sources. And it could you, you could have an on-chain program that that just via smart contracts aggregates multiple on-chain liquidity sources, but doesn't that have the authority to just take the, the funds. Chain. Yes, all it would all have to be. Yeah. Yes. I. Uh, oh, yeah, I see. So there's a the difference is part. when it's all on chain, or, uh, all on one chain, or or across. Yeah. Chain. Now you can try and use like various you know cross-chain bridges and stuff like that. But sorry, you're absolutely right. I I was ignoring the the difficulty or like nuances in like wrappers on tokens to get on different chains that's absolutely or right. even if like a significant volume of that pair is on a centralized exchange like binance now i need some trust some way of like ensuring that the rfq that shapeshift is providing is actually based off the spot price of binance and they're not just making something up and then giving away my money to themselves for free yes but you there's a way around that what you can do is get liquidity providers to provide on-chain liquidity uh, just arbing against Binance a little bit wider, and then you Perfect. can reference that on it's chain. The same, it's the same market makers that would be on the on chain that would be providing in Binance anyway. I mean, the top five firms on Binance probably account for half the volume on Binance themselves, right? So there's no yeah. there, there, yeah. there's no need to go to Binance if you can access the LP that is market making on Binance. Right? Yeah. It's the same as the structure in equities markets. There's no need to go to the New York Stock Exchange if you can go yeah. to the jump themselves. Right. What Robin Hood discovered. Yeah, I guess yeah. I was trying to answer the question from Eric about like, so yes, 
I agree that order books didn't take off on Ethereum because of the scalability concerns. But I guess when it comes to a RFQ system versus an AMM, I, I'd say AMM took off because of the trust as liquidity because there is no order books on Ethereum. Would that be fair? I, think it's I mean, uh, yeah, like an AMM is basically an RFQ system that plugs into a particular type of liquidity, single particular type of liquidity pool, which is the AMM curve uh, and whoever's providing in it. And so I think that like it's it's sort of a shitty RFQ because it yeah. only has access to like shitty liquidity. But, trust but I think liquidity, that's the that's like that's part of what the, right, the trustless liquidity is shitty yes. on Ethereum. Historically. I think it took off, yeah, I think it took off also because it it recognized that uh, there's a lot of idle capital in crypto, right? So yeah. when people's capital is truly idle to the point that they don't even care if it loses money. That's a great spot to put it in an AMM. So a good example is a team, yeah. right? If a team has infinite tokens of their team token, and then they have some ETH that they don't mind using to support the market making the liquidity, then they're like, I just put it in the pool, and then it's irrelevant yeah. with the profit and losses. I'm supporting the liquidity. It's still less than what I have to pay, you know, a top tier token market maker for. So there, it's a clear win win because they can't lose, right? Yeah, um, I think I think what you're getting at is a really important point, which is that these AMMs allowed individuals to put up liquidity without knowing how to do that yes, right like to, exactly. to be a market maker is kind of a sophisticated thing that most people don't know yeah. how to do but you can throw your money into an amm and you are reasonably ready to go and th that was just so easy now yeah and the first phase was people who didn't care if they were up or down money now we're in a phase where i do think most people contributing to amms they do generally want they prefer wealth like they they prefer to make some money but they're not sure if they're making it yet. I think it was very clear they were making it before because of the token drops and the token prices were high so they could farm that. And the APRs are all on the sites. So like if the APR is 300%, even if the coin's moving a ton, it doesn't really matter because you're still able to farm and dump a token that's worth much more than your impermanence loss. You're gonna get to the, you're gonna get to the equilibrium very soon now where people are like, am I actually making money or not? Um, and if, if they, these people just want to outperform buy and hold, right? So they're just saying, if I put my coins here at the end of a week, at the end of a month, have I outperformed just buy and holding these? If the answer is yes, then they're happy. And you know they wouldn't have access to any other way to invest necessarily on chain. So AMM, I guess, is the first native ability, is the first native way that you can invest assets on chain, aside from lending them on a DeFi platform. Uh, this is like the second native way that you can invest uh, your money. So that that to me i do think there's something powerful there there's something interesting there where that liquidity it does have some value in the real world too right if they were to lend that to a block five then it could they get a rate and then a market maker would borrow it against them uh with an intermediary so here you're, they're kind of just putting it out there they're they're all, almost really giving it away too cheap given the way that amms are currently designed uh and leading to these gas wars but you know if if it didn't lead to gas wars where the miners end up having all the value like i, I have this I have this tweet where it's like the governance token buyers are basically paying the Ethereum miners, right? It's just a very convoluted way that, that they're going about doing this. Uh, but if that were to stop uh, or, or get fixed, then you could have you could have a situation where people are actually they they are provably uh, beating buy and hold, right? Let's say the 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 protocol offers them ability to buy strangles, it offers them ability to hedge out their impermanence loss, then they can say, okay, here's your risk profile. Worst thing that can happen is this. Worst thing that can happen is that. And then people say, okay, I can contribute to that. Whereas with the central limit order book, they can't do anything like that. All, all they can do is just trade passively. And then they're sitting there on their coin. And unless it's a stakeable coin, uh, you're just sitting there wondering what the hell you can do with it. Um, so, you know, like uni, right? Like no one knows what to do with uni. So obviously as soon as you farm it, you put it in the uni pool. Uh, and then, you know, insane amounts of uni are put in the uni pool. So anything that people don't know what to use, they actually love putting in pools, even without incentives now. Um, because they're like, I don't, I got a free, I'm not sure what it's worth, but I'm happy to put it in versus ETH because ETH I'm also not sure. And it, they're both risky coins. So I think um, it's, it wouldn't take that much to turn it into something very real from that point of view. Well, let's talk about the risks. What sorts of tangible risks are there to, you know, mainstream users that aren't necessarily narrowly the diehards uh, yield farming right now? You know, is it is it some uh, 
bug in this in the smart contract? Is it some clever exploit of how all of DeFi is composed together? You know, what are the real risks to regular people who just kind of want to earn some yield in DeFi, but maybe aren't necessarily crypto native people? Number goes down. Well, to I mean, zero. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, but I think that's not the biggest risk. Like, yes, there that there is a risk that funds get stolen. That is real. That is not most of the value lost by retail. Most of the value lost is they end up with all their money in a shitcoin, and then the shitcoin loses its value. Like that. Okay. That's sort of like realistically speaking, where the mo you know the larger value loss is. Yeah, but arguably also that's where the most of their value is gained. Whereas if there's a yep. bug or an exploit, there's no there's no reciprocating gain. It's just a, mm -hmm. it either doesn't happen or it does and you're completely wiped out. And I think the main, the main loss that a lot of people still don't think about is simply that these are very new protocols and very complicated. Uh, and whenever you're using them, the money can just get stuck or lost or go away. That like a hundred percent loss is gone. Yeah. That's, that is the big loss. And if people can just accept that and realize that that's the, that's kind of the, the risk that they're entering, then everything else is kind of just understandable and reasonable. Yeah. Um, so sort of a tangent, but one of the questions I've always had that wasn't answered is how is the how is the constant in the constant function market maker chosen? <laughs> I've, I've, I, I think I think it's Vitalik that does it, right? Oh really? Is it just the <laughs> okay. The number is this. I mean, by, I mean, uh, Uniswap just does it ran like it's just fixed. It's one, but then like uh, balancer and stuff allows it. it it'll, it's a little bit more customizable when you like create a curve. You can like parameterize that. That's that's essentially what's happening when you like when you do like a ninety eight two curve or something. Essentially, you're just playing with the constants a little bit. Okay. Yeah, Uniswap doesn't have a constant. Yeah. Oh. Or it, it, it the, the constant is just what was the initial thing put the in the initial the price, ratio, sure. Yeah. The initial ratio. Yeah. Okay. Got gotcha. it. So, um, do we want to talk a little bit more about the kind of decks that you're building, Sunny? Um, I mean, just I'd like to hear about it. it. Yeah, I mean, we're just working on uh, also like order book based stuff uh, on built on the Cosmos SDK, uh, but we're focusing very heavily mostly on the privacy side of it because that's kind of what I what I really care about. Uh, so working on like getting um, like having snarks, uh, like basically it's a multi asset shielded Zcash pool, uh, and then the order book is public, but then you can't actually link when orders are who's making which order. So currently one of the problems on like most order books is like, you can be like, Oh, this address made this order and this order and this order and it canceled this one. And you can just like piece to some piece together someone's entire trading strategy that way. Uh, with what we're doing, you can't really uh, correlate who is making what orders. Um, yeah. So that's what, that's what we're working on. And then on top of that, just working on some things around like front running prevention um, and other fun add-ons like that but really really this is sort of a beginning um of a larger our goal is to see how to what we really care about is just like private smart contracts in general uh and just the interactions between a shielded pool and contra and like visible contracts and so the decks is sort of just the a first uh tool of that but then really our plan is like so there's a smart contracting system called cosmwasm uh, and so seeing how we can have like a, uh, a shielded Zcash pool interact with like Cosmosm smart contracts and stuff. So eventually we want to be able to like recreate, get, get all the smart contracts that are being built today in DeFi, but allow them to be done in a more private way. So how do you guys see uh, decentralized exchange and AMMs evolving given a cross chain interoperable world? So, you know, in the next two how, how do you think that would play out? I think the major macro change is simply that uh, one or more D, uh, AMMs needs to move onto a chain that can handle the volume. So certainly 
you know, Sam's doing that with Solana. Um, but anything, anything that gets away from these crazy gas costs, I think is what unlocks sort of the next phase of this. There's this, the ceiling of fees that just goes, you know, parabolic whenever the activity increases. So that, that should be the next evolution, I would think. And I think you're going to see a big, um, like, layer one wars coming up soon where they all try to have their protocol level decks. Uh, they, they, I think there are a lot of smart minds that are working on just this now because they recognize that this is a use case of, of blockchains. Um, I think the, the real question also will be, can ETH layer two, you know, ship fast enough that they can compete, right? Uh, whether it's yeah. through optimistic yeah. or through ZK. I, I think that it's, it's, it, it, it remains to be seen yet, but uh, the users right now, they are, they, they are very much on Ethereum because ERC-20 has had a very strong network effect, right? D despite all of Ethereum's issues, um, people, exchanges, they generally have found some use that we all use ERC-20, right? For, for our tokens, for our stable coins. Um, so I think um, with that said, the new layer ones or, or the new stuff, they're very much going to be able to bridge into these assets uh, more so than the competitors of two years ago or three years ago where they wouldn't have been able to access that. So I think that the competition for the ETH native apps, which are going to go on layer two, um, there's also a big community aspect as well, where right now a lot of the users, they, they, they like Ethereum, so, so they want to stay in it as much as possible. But the real, but the real use case, if crypto is going to be huge, is people that don't even care what it is, right? They don't care what the crypto is. They don't care what the base asset, what the base technology is. They just want to use something that works. So I kind of see, again, like like a fragmentation there, where you could have, uh, you could have stuff that ships to the masses that that is very easy to use and very good UX. If you have that, um, I don't think anyone's going to care what chain it's on. They don't even know what chain it's on. Um, and so that I think is the big, that I think is the big, big, uh, opportunity in the space. And I think that some projects will unfortunately go down the route of just saying, okay, I'm just a little bit better than this ETH deck. So I'm a little bit better than that. I forked this, but I changed a little bit of that. And I think that, that that's all very like zero sum like kind of stuff that's happening. Um, kind of disappoints me to see as well that's happening on Ethereum, but I, I do respect the ambition that a lot of these layer one projects have now for DeFi, which is to say I'm reimagining it in a way, in a much better way. I'm going to be able to show this here, you know, to, to, to random new people and they're going to use it out of the box. Um, that I think is really exciting. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. curious if, uh, if, if you guys that have been closer to Cosmos are seeing anyone building um, AMMs in the Cosmos world yet. Like I kind of, I kind of feel like that must be happening right now. And as soon as IBC comes out, mm -hmm. a half a dozen of these projects will be there like within a week. Um, am I being overly optimistic there, or is that maybe happening? Maybe no. not in a week, but we did grant a close project in Cosmos. They're called B Harvest, and they're validators in our ecosystem, and they are building an AMM that is tailor made for the Cosmos Hub. And so that's. You know, that'll be shipped somewhat in tandem with IBC or a little after. A week ago. A couple of chains that have added AMMs, like Iris and there's a couple uh, and others. Yeah, Iris has coins. I there. actually think what makes sense is most Cosmos chains should probably just have their own AMM. Um, how I see AMMs are they're not like exchanges, right? Like, you know, if, if you have a currency exchange, you know, you could go tra trade on an FX market. But Uniswap or like AMMs are just like the currency exchange desk at the airport. Like it, it's good for convenience purposes. And so if you want to just make a quick swap, like, you, you know, you, you're, you're going to get screwed over on prices. But like, you know, if, if it's worth it for the convenience, I think most change will probably have an AMM built in. Or yeah, very if, often have if one. you want to transact with the chain that has the most liquidity coming through it and in the Cosmos ecosystem, that would be the hub. So yeah, in, in, in general, it's it's just being deployed as a module in Cosmos SDK in any any uh, any zone to theoretically just plug it in and have that functionality. Yeah. So is the B harvesting is that a module 
that in, they're that building the module, yeah. And then okay. they're doing is um, upstreaming it to the Cosmos SDK, and then they're composing it in a way that's going to deploy like AMN functionality for the hub. Cool. And then it makes sense when IBC messages come through because then they're going to be able to swap at you know some uh, some value that the AMN decides. Mm -hmm. I feel we needed an AMM maximalist for this call. <laughs> I feel all of us were a little bit skeptical on AMMs. I don't think you're going to find an AMM maximalist today. I think two days ago you would have found plenty. But I think <laughs> <laughs> what happened in the last two days that I missed? Oh, ETH is down. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> what that's yeah. what causes people's sentiment on AMMs to change. That's correct. <laughs> Okay. Also, the uni token is down. That's the other thing. Yeah, it, 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 so, so there is no such thing as AMM maximalism unless price is up. Right. I don't think there's ever been a yeah. I don't think there's ever been an AMM maximalist unless it's it's purely the idea that you know they have this token, so they're shilling it right, and they're saying that this will rule the world, this will flip in Coinbase, this will capture all global finance. And then as soon as they dump the token, they're they're like, okay, yeah. like, yeah. what's the next? Like, yeah. you know, what's the next thing? So you get a lot of that on Twitter, or you get a lot of that in general. Um, I think that like the like the defense of AMM, it almost doesn't even need to be defended because it's already proven itself, right? It, like, there's no way to take that away from it. Like, it's already become the empirically only thing it's working. Empirically, it's already it's already on the chain. And then the question is, how do you make them better? How do you make them smarter? You know which ones will survive like for me the question of which one will survive is almost not as interesting as the question of what would it look like if it were to survive what would it enable people to do if uh you know if it were to succeed so like the ideal amm right is like people they can just supply in kind and get back in kind returns they supply bitcoin they can get bitcoin like they can get bitcoin in kind returns they get a sense of their risk profile they can have a guaranteed uh floor on the bottom, let's say that they don't lose more than 5%, it gets pulled if they lose more than that. You know, they can, keep, you know, they can segment between, you know, sharp takers and non-sharp takers so that latency are is, is taken out, sort of like what synthetics did, right? Synthetics they had huge problems with front runners for months. People that were just coming in and arbitraging the flow, you know, basically front running the Oracle. Um, and then they implemented a fee reclamation where they would claim back some of that money if they found that your trades correlated with the move of the market, right? Um, so the, after that happened, the front running stopped mostly. So if you have an AMM where you stop front running uh, or you stop latency arm, then you can lower fees. And then you can say, this is now, uh, you know, on par with something else. Like basically, I think what AMMs can enable is it can enable users to pretend like they're, they're market makers, right? And they can, they can, they can capture part of the, the that spread. Whereas in centralized markets, no matter how good you are, uh, you're almost never making money when you place a limit order, right? Your limit order becomes a short option for the rest of the market to hit. Uh, and that's why exchange fees are negative usually for, make, for maker orders, positive for limit orders. So you already have an overlay where people understand that by being a maker, you need to get paid. And the question is, can you get paid enough that you're also benefiting from the overall volume? And so I think like, there's no point almost being like too bearish or bullish AMMs because it's it's just one building block of finance that's already in normal finance in the from a point of view of flow internalization. And I think people in crypto in general, they, they have a very like winner take all mentality when reality is very different, right? Mm -hmm. Like in in reality, there's like fragmentation going on every day in stock markets, in FX markets, in, in all markets, right? Like stock markets have gotten more fragmented every year for 20 years now. Um, FX markets have gotten fragmented more every year for 30 years now. So I think people always tend toward like winner take all narratives because they're shilling a bag, right? They're like, I have this bag and I need you all to buy this bag. For you to believe that this bag can be huge, you need to believe they can win everything. And so you end up with tons of this kind of stuff that goes around everywhere. And then you just look at the reality of the actual space, like nothing has a high market share, nothing has a high dominance. Anytime it gets big enough, competitors can come in and lower fees. Look out, you know, users get uh, dragged away to other things. I mean, I remember talking about BitMEX, the, the dominance a couple years ago, and people thought, you know, BitMEX, they had all the liquidity, had everything. Uh, it's impossible to beat it. It's, it's already got the use. And then, you know, FTX showed that obviously that's not true. You know, there has been gaining market share like every month for the past year and a half. 
a lot of other exchanges have popped up, have popped up and done things. So I think um, the, 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 the big challenge for AMMs, I think the developers of these, they already know. Uh, the users right now are in this kind of a, I wouldn't call it a lala land, but I would say they are setting themselves up for a fall if they think that they can properly value these tokens, uh, given what they currently know. But the underlying ideas, they've already been proven. Like, they can't even be disproven anymore. They already exist and do, and do a lot of volume. Mm -hmm. They're playing hot potatoes with their money right now. Hot, hot yams, mm -hmm. maybe. Hot yams. <laughs> hot yams, sorry. Yeah, so do, do you guys see an insurance market as sort of a second building block that emerges out of this, where AMM would be the first one, and then we have you know insurance that kind of uh, balances that out? I think uh, Ave has has that kind of kind of a system right I mean, now. You can have insurance for like smart contract bugs. I can't really insure against like bad trading. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just called hedging. Yeah. Um, so like, like you know, uh, the protocol taking a sort of tax pool, and then for that to um, execute in any case that there's there's like a like a bug that was found or something. Yeah. Sure. I mean, um, fine. Yeah, I, I think that insurance is going to be part of the ecosystem, but not a big one. I think it's like, I would guess it's like, you know, 5%, 2%, I don't know, 2% maybe sounds about right. So like, it's something, but it's like, you know, not one of the top four pieces of the ecosystem. Which are the top four? In DeFi in particular, I think like uh, liquidity venues, uh, whether it's a DEX or an AMM, uh, some sort of pool-like structure, um, which is AMMs make use of, but as is, so does staking and yield farming. Um, some margin facility, whether it's derivatives or borrow lending. Um, and then on-ramps and off-ramps, whether you're talking about cross-chain things or whether you're talking about uh, fiat. Yeah. Um. Do we want to open the floor up to Q and A now? Because we're past the one hour mark, <laughs> and we were supposed to uh, do a separate segment with with Eric, but I think we've had just a very natural conversation with the five of us, so we would just leave it at that. Yeah, let's do some questions. Okay, let's take some questions from the audience. Um. Someone says, sexes have no future. CEXs have no future. Do you guys agree or disagree? Probably disagree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who knows for sure, but I, would, I wouldn't put my money on it. I, yeah. I can't see the decentralized um, exchange um, having any on-ramp or off-ramp functionality. Uh, you can, I mean, there has to be a centralized element for the fiat, but you could have it just be a single knob somewhere. Right, like you KYC with a, you know, with like a little box. And you like send money to that box and sends tokens to your address, and then you're in DeFi after that. I mean, USDT so, uh, is sort of like a central yeah, that's right. without an exchange. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. the I think um, the the frictions caused by by regulation is going to drive a lot of volume into these decentralized exchanges, but uh, at the same time, much of the real money as it gets into the system is from institutions who either for their own governance or due to regulations on them can only use certain venues. Um, and so they are going to be, I think, mostly integrated with centralized exchanges for quite a while. Yeah. yeah I definitely agree. Okay. And, I think, and I think centralized exchanges, you know, Bitcoin is by far the biggest asset in the crypto space and will be. And so I think, for most of those users too, they don't see that much benefit from being on a DEX uh, versus being on centralized exchange where they can log in, they have a two FA, they have you know someone they can talk to when something goes wrong, right? Institutions especially. So I, I think it's it's definitely not a winner take all kind of a mentality. The next question is from Sergio Bravo. He says, "Funny that SBF mentioned the reduction of arbitrage as a con for AMM. Isn't this the main strategy of Alameda?" Do you think this is going to be less usual on AMM built on Solana? I, so I here's how I think I would describe it. Like, 
I'm thinking from sort of the spaces point of view, it's a weird thing. So arbitrage, it's bad for the space if arbitrage exists, but good if someone does it, is I think the right way to think about this. Basically, the existence of arbitrage means there's inefficiency and people are paying too much. But the way you fix that is by doing the arbitrage, which brings markets more in line. So I'm like in favor of people doing arbitrage, but also in favor of designing systems that try and lessen the amount of arbitrage that exists in the first place. And so I think that like, you know, there's sort of like large arbitrages sometimes on Uniswap because it's slow and expensive and there's lots of people AMMing. Um, and that's bad, although it's maybe good if you're a trading firm. Um, whereas I think Serum uh, already has like way less ARB opportunities, um, which is good. And the last thing I'll say is that there's a weird way in which Serum has more arbitrage opportunities and also less slippage which is that gas fees are basically zero. Like gas fees are just a deadweight loss and uh, uh, to, to the, the people trading. And so if you can get rid of like that $5 on each order, you know, that, that surf can be split up between both parties and make both sides happier. I don't pronounce, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but he asks, Looks like big fees in Ethereum is the only argument against Dex, but Dex, it's not Ethereum. What you, what you will tell us when Dex will come on Cosmos SDK with zero fee? Soon. Maybe you want to address this um, I mean, yeah, like you mentioned, like there's a lot of Dexes being on built on non-Ethereum platforms. So you know, uh, Serum is one example. Uh, like. Our our zero knowledge dex is an, is one that's being built on the Cosmos SDK. Um, I I think that as we see more scalable blockchains, I think we're going to see a uh, an increase in like more sophisticated dexes on new chains. Yeah, I think dexes yeah. may may end up taking the majority of volume with time, and it certainly can't happen on Ethereum until it becomes more scalable. So. Yeah, there, there's two questions like what are the negatives of DEXs generally and then what are the negatives of an AMM? Because once you move to a faster chain, as we talked about earlier, perhaps order book DEXs will become popular and, and well used also. Yeah. I, I do think with the faster chains, you're going to have, you know, protocol level DEXs. For instance, you can also have, you can solve the problem of minor extracting value, right? You can have like in near protocol, for instance, you have force ranking of, of transactions. You have it so that you can't, uh, you know, because right now in Ethereum 2, if the miners wanted to, they could start putting their hands into some jars too and saying, can we start copying, right? You can have generalized bots that copy the best arbitrage trades and just do them ourselves. Uh, you can have all these kind of things. So I think there are all these philosophical theoretical limitations of, of DEXs that hopefully new chains will provide a different take on. And so, so, I think that that can be the next wave of DeFi will be very non ether in my opinion. Yeah. Another thing we're saying is like MEV just goes way down if a block times go down, and and, and like you know the, yeah. the the ability to actually get in, in each block goes down. We have another question from Ming. They ask, "What are your thoughts on batch auction mechanisms? Originally introduced in Chicago-based trading to avoid sniping." Do you think these can be applied to AMMs and used to prevent front running? Nah. So, I mean, in our design, we are not batch auctions. We're using batch execution. Um, and so I'm not sure if that's what was actually being referred to. But, um, yeah, I think that. On what time? What's like the timing between auctions or executions? Um, on a blockly basis. How long are blocks? It's like seconds like, or something? Yeah, like one or two seconds. Yeah. it's That's not. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think like an order book is back batch execution too, just on like a much shorter, you know, time scale. Um, yeah. But but the truth is like any on chain AMM is in some ways kind of maybe going to be batch execution on a one block time scale, like things you can try and do to get around that. Uh, it's like not not super easy. Um, I, but I, but but it's sort of like very different than like you know once an hour batch auctions or something. Yeah, like yeah, I, I think I mean I, essentially what we're, the batch execution for on chain are mostly a, a hack around the fact that like well you know block times aren't instant as you might or 
near instant as like a centralized exchange would be. So it just provides some fairness to the fact that like block times are like on discrete intervals. Yeah. I do think they're a good idea for token offerings, though. I think you saw that with you know the, the original wave of Uniswap, initial Uniswap offerings. You had the sort of speed bots compete to buy it, you know, to, to, to buy it up, and then knowing that you know retail would then come and buy it up further, right? So I think the the, the more recent projects they've either done uh, balancer pool um, projects where they do like you know like, like every interval they have a amount of supply that you can buy. Or through Nosa, uh, through Gnosis Mesa, where there's like a auction clearing mechanism. So I think it's good for token offerings, um, yeah. where you need to transfer a large amount of coins from the team to the community. But I don't see it as a way that you can really have in and out intraday trading. But I could be wrong on that actually, because there's some, there are some traditional markets where they that do kind of function more like that. Um, but I don't see the type of asset yet that would really benefit from that versus just a normal. Yeah, and another thing I'd say is like it batch auctions don't really help that much. Um, they they help a bit, um, I but like there are issues with them. Um, if they're like very very sparse, and you're still getting picked off to like things, a little bit. Bef like 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 part of this is just like I don't know if you're like completely latency insensitive and retaily like maybe you should be taking and not providing it is like like maybe maybe sort of one way around this too. Um, and like, uh, but, but, but sort of, you know, putting that aside, if you are going to provide like, yeah, you, it's like last time you're still exposed though to like each auction, like, you know, moves right before that auction. Um, and, uh, yeah. Also like more inefficient pricing in general, like generally you should assume like pricing is inefficient by like square root of like, you know, fraction of a times daily volatility times. Uh, yeah, so. Next question is, don't you agree that smart contracts could not trust order books or RFQ to execute market orders compared to very liquid AMM? Why? Hmm. I don't think that's true. If it's if they're on chain, like if it's an off chain order book, then yeah, that's absolutely right. If it's an on chain order book, then I think it still works. Yeah, as long as it's like synchronous uh, yeah. execution, it should be fine. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe there's an argument to be made that like, if if a uh, AMM has some lock in for liquidity, so like if you have liquidity that's like locked and you can't withdraw it for like two weeks, but then you could just say the same thing. Oh, you can't cancel orders off the right. book for like two weeks. It's like, yeah. nah, not really. It's not, it's not a bad point, actually, though, because if you have a flash crash, in, in flash crashes, a lot of market makers will just pull out all quotes, they'll make them really wide. And so in an AMM, you do have some benefits where you do have people that are willing to provide liquidity, even in insane, even in insane like market that. conditions. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah. Um, good but, for the takers. Uh, good for the takers. Um, good if you're doing a market order. Um, so I think. But, but yeah, it's not 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 any either or. I think that the market makers will definitely not want to be seen in the markets uh, in those conditions, but they will be able to be much tighter in normal conditions, or they'll be able to offer better pricing in normal conditions. So aggregators will probably use both, right? To if you if you're doing a market order, you're probably going to end up hitting centralized exchanges as well as DeFi as well as you know OTC, right? If you're, if you're let's say selling hundred thousand ether straight right now for a, for like a day. That's going to actually hit all sorts of liquidity. You're not going to choose which one. Uh, you're not going to be able to choose. It's just going to be based on the best price. Yep. Do you guys think that all the airdrops on ETH are giving it velocity problems? What's a velocity problem? Good question. Is that like Maybe. too much activity on chain? I don't, I don't know, know what the velocity problem is. Yeah, I, I'm guessing his name is awesome, by the way. I'm guessing that he's just referring to <laughs> congestion on the network. And yeah, oh. I mean, um, it's yeah. 
like it's it's sort of you, you know in order to scale like that's sort of like saying don't do anything is it bad to try and do something cool because like then you start bidding up gas and i think the real answer is like you got to find a way to make you know a place where you can do more things for less gas like the problem isn't with trying to do something cool yeah it's like well said <laughs> Any any use case is going to cause velocity problems, so it's you shouldn't focus on the use case. You should focus on fixing the velocity issue itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's all about negative. Oh, go ahead. It's just negative network effects. I think is, is what it's coming to, and you saw that with the one thousand where that came out when Uniswap air, airdrops came. Right, I think fundamentally the architecture of applications competing for block space in layer one is very. Is it very scary, right? If you if you if you come up with an idea and you want to, you know, roll it out to your users, and then you find you, and then you find that you're not having to compete with some Uniswap airdrop, which is putting it at a thousand way, you know, so high that your application can't run, your users can't use it, you know, that that architecture is almost certainly is not the architecture of, of Web three, right? It doesn't look, it wouldn't make any sense. So I think pe people are realizing this now more and more um, after that Uniswap. So, so I think it's a good thing because I think it reckon. People now, you know, see that there are actually very strong limitations to what can be done, and it's pushing people to work on layer two faster. On ETH. It's, it's it's getting people to experiment with other chains more seriously. So it's good that it happened relatively early in DeFi. I think, um, you know, if it had semi scaled a bit, and then it happened when there's a ton of money at stake, you know, you could see a ton. Of, you could see some quite nasty attacks that can happen where people spam the network. People try to liquidate everyone, you know, th there's all these things that could have still happened. So I, so I think given the way the space evolved, this is like almost the safest way DeFi could have possibly evolved to, to get to where we are now. I wish there was a blockchain architectural paradigm that would solve this. Maybe, you know, something like Cosmos, where we're not- I thought, you're, I thought you were gonna say Tron. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the Cosmos does this, right? I, the, the, our entire premise was like, let's not have everyone parasiting each other for like, let's remove this negative at the point where eventually network effects become negative. And so let's put everyone on their own network. So that way that doesn't happen. In this hot potato yam game, how could retail approach evaluating new DeFi projects in a better way? All right. So, <laughs> uh, first, the retail person needs to decide whether they are just trying to gamble and play roulette, or if they're trying to own a valuable project for some period of time, which is more like investing. Uh, too many people conflate those two things, uh, think one is the other. If you're just trying to gamble, then it doesn't really matter. You're just trying to get there ahead of other people and go to the new hotness. But if you're trying to invest in something meaningful, then you have to answer the question of what is the what is the real economic value provided by this thing, right? When you look at YAM, I can't answer that. And maybe I'm not smart enough, but I can't see the real economic value there at all. When I look at something like Uniswap, I can. Um, so it's, it's really just tr trying to see where that economic value is and cutting through the noise. A lot of Ethereum competitors tout high TPS. Has Solana been stress tested to prove it's high TPS? Yeah, that's like the that's like the easiest thing to prove. Uh, it, we stress tested it in our first call with the Solana team before we'd even considered using them as a blockchain. Like as the call was going on, um, uh, and sort of later, I mean, it's like you know the Serum Dex alone is currently processing like ten times the throughput of Ethereum, um, and that's like without very many users at all. Um, so. Uh, yeah, TPS is super easy to stress test. There are other things that are harder to stress test. And in general, I think interestingly, the core blockchain is easier to stress test than all the tooling around it. Like, especially for a newer chain, if you think it, it it's broken or breaking or sucks or has problems, it's probably not the consensus. Like, probably it's like some, whatever fucking server is sitting between you and the blockchain preventing DDoS attacks or whatever wallet software you're using or something like that, that's not stress tested. Like that's definitely been the case for Solana that like all the sort of like throughput issues that we have had, like ironically the blockchain has not been the throughput limiting steps, had way higher than throughput than the centralized steps of like making, you know, putting stuff up to make sure it doesn't get DDoSed. Um, 
and and so like uh that's i think the thing where like ethereum's had years upon years to stress test infura is a good example right like the sort of like infrastructure that relays information from the block producers to mass consumers um and that's the sort of thing which it's like obviously theoretically solvable and not related to the core blockchain technology so it's not like a, a fundamental property of the blockchain uh but it, it is like a thing that you actually do need to build and do well at and like takes time to like realize oh shit like did we forget to put up any servers that are easy to access and well advertised that are not censored by this particular country like oh god we didn't turns out it's very slow in practice to access the blockchain explorer the main explorer from like you know 10 percent of the world like that that's the sort of, the sort of thing that like takes a lot more ironing out. All right. Last question. What are your respective views of ETH DeFi prices ahead of October, November? Volatility in light of the broken parabolic rise. Someone wants to know about you guys' price forecasting. Um, well, Basically, this is again like if you believe in F over over time, then you shouldn't care about the prices in October or November. It's kind of like it's just the noise. Um, you know, like as I've gone through all the Bitcoin bubbles, the the immateriality of any given month's movement becomes so obvious. You know, many months or years later, uh, but back in the day when it's happening, people fret over things. So people are probably freaking out that Ethereum has fallen from $400 to $300 or whatever. Uh, and in two, in two years, when it's like $7,000, it's going to be very silly that people were worried about that. So zoom out and chill out and try to focus on what matters and where the, where the economic utility is. Well, you need to tell them if it's going to go up to inform whether or not they should be an AMM maximalist. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I think the biggest issue for F's price right now is again these fees, and I just I keep going back to it. But um, ETH is really in a race against itself. It 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 has this huge network effect, all this activity, mm -hmm. but these fees that are just killing it. And so that it, there's a plan to upgrade into the 2.0 version, but everyone knows that is many months away. Um, and if they move too fast, they could break the whole thing. And if they move too slow, they could be Kind of outmaneuvered by some other layer one chains so yeah it's a it's exciting and i don't i don't have any good answers for it question yeah here, i'm um, constantly monitoring whether or not anyone's um exploiting mv i think that's one of the oh, most people are trying to, um uh, are you like what, what what are your just assuming you're like more plugged into this like what are your kind of thoughts on like Bitcoin and DeFi. Like, do you think that where, where how do you think that's gonna take place? Do you think it's gonna be Bitcoin being pegged onto Ethereum? Are there gonna be like native DeFi chains for like sidechain to Bitcoin? Or where do you see um, or do you see there's a demand for DeFi within the Bitcoin community? By by the way, I have to, I, I unfortunately have to run now. I I'm a piece of shit and forgot that I have another call. <laughs> so no worries, Sam. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to hop off and go there, but it was great talking to y'all. Um, and thanks for having me. Bye, Good Sam. Cheers. Thanks for coming. See ya. We'll have, uh, let, let's say, two, I think there's there's like a couple more questions flowing in at the last second. Um, so so one, Bi Bitcoin on uh, Bitcoin and DeFi. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's obviously a demand for, to use Bitcoin in these DeFi protocols. And the people who say there aren't are generally the maximalist types that are just butthurt and bitter that it's not happening on Bitcoin itself right now. <laughs> um, so I, there's a few ways it can happen. One is these like wrapped or pegged tokens, which are emerging. Um, I don't know to what degree those will be successful. Maybe they, maybe they will, maybe some of them will. Um, then there's sort of like the cosmos approach where you can get through um through ibc you can get good linkage between layer one chains so you might end up 
using layer one Bitcoin and then moving easily into a DeFi protocol on a different chain within Cosmos. Um, that's very plausible. Uh, then there's sort of like the, the Thor chain type approach where, which, which is similar, but um, just moving between assets more effortlessly. Like if you can trustlessly and easily and efficiently move between Bitcoin into ETH or Bitcoin into Cosmos, then uh, you can start using it in various ways on DeFi. But whether the demand is there or not, I think it, it, mm -hmm. it absolutely is. Um, it's more of a cultural it's more of a cultural issue where it, like the, the people that own F are going to be a little more willing to experiment, to play around. Uh, and the people that own Bitcoin are a little more like curmudgeonly and kind of want to just sit on it. Um, those attitudes will change as they start seeing and using some of this stuff. But to them, it's a little bit new and scary. Hmm. Okay, last question. Suzu, do you do any intraday trading? Is your strategy the same as if you were trading for yourself? Yeah, so we've been around eight years. We, we started in the foreign exchange markets. And I'd say that some of our strategies are very intraday and some of them are longer term. It's, it really runs a it really runs a gamut. Um, I think we were relatively early in DeFi just because we saw that um, the that this would actually become very popular among users, um, for one. And for two, is that um, it represents a, an, like an interesting new way that people interact with each other um, directly uh, without intermediaries. So I think that um, you know, we, we got more and more into longer term investing based on that as well, into, into the application layer. Um, so, but yeah, we have a team uh, based in Singapore. We have some people in Hong Kong as well. So we, uh, I mean, strategy wise, I would say intraday directional, probably not as much as, you know, people would tend to think, um, but sort of multi-day directional that definitely, and sort of very lower latencies uh, definitely as well. So. All right, last question. In the context of cross-chain yield farming, uh, citing a possible Ethereum 2.0 delay, do you guys believe other layer one platforms like EOS or NEO will take over the DeFi game? And will adoption mean East nullification? I think that other layer one platforms will grow. I don't. I'm. I don't think it'll be EOS or NEO. To be honest, um, I think. Uh, Solana has a very interesting like take on like trade off curves. Like, uh, they go for a, what I would call a pretty centralized approach, but like very well engineered. And I think it's, I think it's a very valuable point on the trade off curve. Um, I think there'll be other ones that like also like you know, some of the new sh sharding stuff. And then I also think that things that like personally, I think that it'll be mostly application specific chains that are going to be the future uh you know built on cosmos sdk or polka dot substrate things like this where uh you, you where you're not comp where your application has its own chain with its own throughput and it's not like fighting with other applications for throughput and you don't just get demolished when like someone else does some crazy yield farming thing and your gas prices spike Yep. Yeah, I'd I'd say most likely to happen in in the Cosmos world, maybe the polka dot world, maybe the Cardano world. Um, but yeah, I think there's a good chance that this like this wave or this flock of interest moves to these other chains. But the biggest challenge to that is that the composability of these pieces that are in F are not built in these other chains yet. So it's a race to see if those get built and if they get put together faster than F 2.0 can emerge. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. And I also think too that right now people are focused on like each existing network effect and users are already there. But if you look at the numbers, there, there's like hundreds to thousands of users on DeFi. We're not talking about even tens of thousands really. We're not talking about hundreds of thousands. So I think that um, the new chains, if they, if they can make it easy, if they can be a big improvement, then it doesn't even, I don't think each network effect matters at all. In that, in that respect, because the real market you're going after is centralized finance and, and also 
um, you know, a whole new de design space that is possible. I think that can definitely happen on, you know, Cosmos, Polkadot, um, and, and even Neo and these other chains, I think is very possible as well. I think Neo's interesting approach right now, partnering with Binance and OKX, you know, they're, they're kind of creating a more centralized experience in some ways, but uh, a safer one as well, right? Whereas, you know, if they go into the anarchy of ETH, you know, the, there's new ways that this is happening now where, you know, the developer puts in something where you can buy, but you can't sell the coin. Only he can sell the coin. You know, he's put that in the smart contract. So there's all these things where I think, like, the sort of the, the most toxic and nasty part of EFI has been coming out for the last few days. And I think that uh, there's going to be a design space for slightly more centralized type of solutions that could come out, but um, that still protect um, users in a little bit of a cleaner way. And then on top of that, you'll see a lot of the applications that struggled with gas very high. I think you'll see them wanting to develop on Substrate or on Cosmos uh, as well. So I, so I think that there's a huge amount of the market. I'm definitely not an Ethereum maximalist in any sense. I, I think that the concept itself is kind of diluted, right? Because you're talking about technology um, and it may or may not win as the best technology for DeFi. And what about the long-standing status of DeFi? Do you think that's going to maintain itself or is it just going to evolve into maybe something more or different? I just see it as all part of the same arc. Like I really see Bitcoin as like the first DeFi project. And first you had to decentralize money. And now, and then, you know, in the ICO boom, you start decentralizing fundraising. And this new th set of things that is being called DeFi is largely about decentralizing lending markets um, and trading markets. And so it's all just, it's part of decentralized uh, technology, basically consuming finance and just rebuilding it in this, in this new way. Um, it's a multi-decade phenomenon, but it's certainly going to take on different themes and flavors over those years. I would say the one piece that I like take, I would say that I think DeFi needs to do or will do that's different than today is we need more reputation systems. So I think like we need um, like fully trustless things. I don't think make that like sense for all applications. Like my, my belief is that like, you, there's a web of trust in the world where like I trust my friends, they have their friends that they trust, they have their friends that they trust. And uh, DeFi, the, the goal of technology is not to make things fully trustless. It's to, ma it's to make things um, leverage existing trust relationships to make interactions that weren't possible before now possible. So if people are certain degrees of connection away from me, how can we use technology to enable those interactions? And I think that like, that's necessary for like lending and stuff like that, where you, you kind of do need to build in, but it's, but it, the difference is like in the traditional world, you're basically told who to trust. You're like, Oh, trust this entity, trust this ratings agency. It's like, no, no, no. We want like decentralized rating agencies. I think that's sort of like the future. Yeah. Well said. Okay. Let's end this on a note. What is everyone's favorite food group? <laughs> favorite food group. Are you, talk, are you making a DeFi reference? Yes. You're, <laughs> it, is it sushi? Is it yam? Do you like sake? You know, what else, what else is there? All that good stuff. I don't own any of the food tokens, so that might make me a boomer, but <laughs> I, don't have any, I don't have any favorite food ones, uh, and I can't keep track of them all. After Yam Finance and uh, Ham Finance, I went ahead and bought Spam Finance. So I don't know. Maybe I'll do something with that. <laughs> what about you, Susie? Yeah, I think they're all great. I mean, they're, they're all a lot of fun. Uh, just be careful. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay, I'll say that, like, you know, a realistic answer. I think sushi was a very interesting experiment. I think that, like, unlike most of them, but they're, like, you know, just weird ample clones. Like, sushi actually, like, it changed the game, you know, to an extent where it's, like, oh, it, it, it proved that vampire attacks, are, like, you know, the people were talking about this for a long time of, like, oh, liquidity is, like, li liquidity will just wash back and forth. And I think sushi did a really good job at 
proving that that's true. Were vampire attacks a thing before Sushi demonstrated it? Or it was uh, like a theoretical possibility? Or did Sushi kind of invent that? There's this guy on Twitter that I really like. His name is Martin Klung, and he has a blog. And so he talked about it for a while. Um, and and I don't know. He, he's the one who used the term vampire attack. So I don't know if other people use that term. But yeah, I mean, people were always... The question was, how sticky is liquidity? And what's cool mm-hmm. is by having on-chain liquidity that's like program. What 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 was cool is that we have programmable liquidity. The fact that Uniswap mints you an LP token, just how like smart contracts made money programmable. What we also just did was we made liquidity programmable, and that was really cool. And that Sushi showed like, hey, once you make liquidity programmable, just like you make money programmable, you can do all sorts of like interesting things. Cool. Now, uh, yeah, let's let's end it on that note. Thank you all for coming and spending nearly two hours on this call with us. It was extra fun. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, and for everyone who stayed till the end of the stream, it was awesome. And uh, quick plug, we have Hack Adam 5 coming at the end of October. So if you guys are um, wanting to win a $50,000 prize pool that is valued in Adams, either. All right. See you guys. Bye. Bye.